Hi, everyone. Welcome to a Civic Technologist Practice Guide conversation with the author, Sid Harrell. And we are um, going to go ahead and kick off. We're about three minutes past the hour and um, folks will be trickling in. I'm super, super excited to be hosting Sid today at the Shorenstein Center at Harvard. Arguably, her book is one of the most important books in civic tech at this time. Um, it, it came out right as we're all thinking about ways to contribute um, our, our talents in the civic tech community, whether you are someone who is from the private sector um, and are looking to get into civic technologies or already maybe in the civic or in the civic space and are looking to getting into technology. There's so many wonderful lessons that Sid brings with us from the wealth of knowledge um, that she possesses in, in one person. So Sid is a UX researcher and product manager, has been going to civic tech hackathons for over a decade. Um, and after her, her company was sold to Facebook, um, she invested in her career in public service and has been really working with governments at all level, level city, county, federal, state, um, and Code for America and 18F and the US um, and many different US entities and bring such a wealth of knowledge in civic tech and design and product and building technology um, and has contributed to so many different field guides um, around how to design elections and building websites. Um, and Sid will introduce her, herself in a bit as well. We're really, really so thrilled to have her here with us today to share so much of her, her knowledge. So this is the, the format of the next hour we have together. We'll go through a quick introduction. You know, Sid, you can tell us more about the inspiration for all of this and and um, lay the foundation for, for what we're gonna discuss today. And then we'll dive into five really important topics um, from her, her book. So ways to contribute in civic tech, different project types, essential skills, which is a question I know I get quite often, um, working in regulated spaces and very, very importantly, thinking of partnering with different allies in, in government and in civic, civic tech. Um, I came to civic tech after a decade in the private sector and wish I had this guy <laughs> when I started. So, so thank you for, for writing, writing this and telling us more. I'll turn it over to you. Oh, sorry, a few, a few, more, um, a few more things. Um, please go ahead and utilize the Q&A and the chat and please go ahead and introduce yourselves to each other. And some of you here have experience in civic tech as well. So please chime in with your own experiences and we do ask that you keep um, the conversation respectful, and we'll we'll um, look look at that and monitor that for for various questions as as well as we move forward. So please put everything in chat and and, and question and answer, and we'll make sure we get to them. So Sid, take it away. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kathy. Uh, it was so wonderful to be invited to have this conversation with you, in particular here at the Shorenstein Center. Um, I always talk a little bit about how did I get started? And I have this old photo saved on my phone of a post-it on an unconference wall. It's a little hard to read, but it says user experience, citizen experience, how to get the public involved, uh, how to get uh, ideas and data from the public and how to get the design and research community involved. And I trepidatiously stuck it on the wall at City Camp San Francisco back in 2011 or 2012 thinking probably Nobody wants to hear about this because I don't code and this is kind of a coder thing. Um, and quite a few people came to the session. We had a wonderful discussion and that was sort of the start of seeing a path forward in civic tech to a potential career there. Um, and just this past September, um, that ended up at this little book that we're gonna talk about. And if you advance the slide, just a little bit more about where my first civic tech projects came from. Uh, 26 to 2012, I was with a firm called Bolt Peters, which may not be that well known, but may be known to a few of you. I had one government project and I completely forgot about it until something like 2015 when I was trying to rediscover where my interest in this came from. And I bring it up again because it happened to be a pandemic year and it was around local government websites to share H1N1 information in 2009. When Bolt Peters uh, was sold, I worked with the Center for Civic Design on their field guides, which are a wonderful resource I really recommend. Um, field guides to ensuring voter intent. 
and then uh, was at Code for America for a few years. Took me a while, by the way, to get hired there. I initially called Jennifer Polka when that company was sold and said, could you see having a senior UX person on your staff? And she said, I'm not sure what that would be for, you know, but we like you, please keep coming around. Um, so it took me a while uh, to persuade folks to actually bring me in as a design person. And then by the time I left there and went to 18F, that was pretty established as a discipline in civic tech. And I had the opportunity to serve as that org's first chief of staff from 2017 to 2018 and really think about how to manage a large organization of people coming from the private sector into the public sector to serve. And uh, since finishing my term there, I have been with the California courts, which has been a whole new adventure learning about the judiciary and legal tech and the needs of people who are representing themselves in civil legal cases. So a definition is good, yes. <laughs> what is civic tech? Um, I'll give you a couple of my definitions as framing. We can go forward one or two slides. And uh, so one, we, um, folks in civic tech, and I think many others, we wanna access services, but also exercise our rights and build communities with the same ease and respect that we experience in the best digital technology. And two, next one. We want public digital goods to be as good as the ones made by commercial entities. And I wanna bring up the concept of public digital infrastructure as well, which isn't my concept, but which I think is so powerful, especially given what we're experiencing in the US right now. Um, I got that phrase from an Ethan Zuckerman blog post that's wonderful. Um, and he's establishing a new institute focused on that over at UMass Amherst. And um, the idea that we need a digital infrastructure for the public that is public oriented and available to everyone seems really resonant with what's going on in the US this week. And we also need a shelf of books. <laughs> so um, mine was not the first by any means. Um, and I'll point out to you in the next slide, just a few books that um, I think are self-consciously civic technology books. Um, and I'm very excited about Marianne Bellotti's forthcoming book about legacy systems. Um, Hannah Schenk and Sarah Hudson's Government Fix, Andrew Schrock's Civic Tech, which has a ton of wonderful stories in it. And Beyond Transparency from back in 2013 when Code for America put it together. It's a good little start on a bookshelf, but one of the things I do at every talk is encourage others to write your book. Yeah, and I, I see chatter from folks um, on in the chat around people who are who have been civic tech. So you all should write your own books too, <laughs> so we all can learn from it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and uh, so so that was uh, my goal in writing a book last year. Without I started it before the pandemic, so I didn't know that I was going to be um, uh, in quarantine doing it. But um, I wanted to provide it an onboarding guide and a bit of a survival manual and help all of us who are trying to do this um, have a common foundation and free ourselves to make some new and more advanced mistakes. <laughs> new and more advanced mistakes, that's, that's great. Um, so can you also tell us a little bit about, your bio talks a little bit about how your company got sold to Facebook and you've now devoted this career to civic tech, what really brought you beyond like going to a bunch of hackathons and being like, I found my space. Um, but it really brought you into this and really what what um, really drove you to write this a few years ago and having it out at this time, right? Like, there's so much foresight there. Um, I, I know I've had several people tell me that this is one of the most critical books they've read so far in the past oh, few months, so. That's really, really gratifying to hear that. Um, I appreciate that. So um, I probably, you know, that 29, 2009 project for um, H1N1 sites probably did influence me a little bit. And a year or so later, Code for America was getting started in San Francisco. And I was kind of curious about it. So I, uh, you know, followed people on Twitter and started replying to them to see what they were up to. Um, and in 2011, I started mentoring their fellows because it turned out their office wasn't that far from where our research firm was. And they didn't have a lot of fellows with user research experience, but they were trying to answer some really interesting questions. Uh, and I discovered that the, the folks who were motivated to do this were very adaptable and curious and really interested in 
you know, partnering with both their, their partners at their cities and their partners in the community. So that was really intriguing. Um, I loved my work at the commercial UX consultancy, but also sometimes we get another car configurator project. It's like, how much good am I doing in the world? And uh, right. <laughs> I was about to be 40 and I had a seven year old kid who was starting to ask me even silly little questions like, how come the sprinklers are on while it's raining? Isn't that wasting water? Can we get the city to turn those off? And it sounds like a really silly question, but how do you figure out how to get the city to turn those off? Yeah, that's such a wonderful example of, I think seeing things that we seemingly sometimes every day take things for granted. And it, so many roads lead back to government. And once you start digging, it's like, this is where. Yeah, um, and then I, I started I to be, see that. Right? You know, as a designer, as a, well, a researcher, a design person, I didn't really think of government as part of the universe of things that I could affect. And that seemed really strange. Um, you know, why didn't I think when I went to a, a rough government website, why didn't I think maybe I could fix that? Or maybe there was somebody I could talk to. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't either. It didn't, it hadn't occurred to me. Yeah. <laughs> studying, and I know some folks have already said this, studying computer science that you know, even if you're interested in, in social impact or whatever term you want to put on it, that government is the place to go for so many of this. So yeah. leading into that, one of the, the sections in your book is ways to contribute. Um, and that's a question I know we often get asked. What are all the different ways one can contribute to this? How can I get involved in this? <laughs> yeah. And folks, as you have questions, put them in the Q&A. If you put them in chat, I may miss it. Um, to put them in the Q&A on this particular topic of ways to contribute and we'll spend about 10 minutes on this topic. Um, yeah. So dividing it kind of broadly, right? There's a lot of volunteer work out there, especially at the local level. It is much more difficult for state and federal organizations to accept volunteer work, but there are CBOs and community community based organizations all over the place that also accept volunteer work. Um, recognizing that not everybody can afford the time or resources to do volunteer work, it can be a great place to go and learn. Uh, in particular, the Code for America Brigade Network and the, the nascent Code for Canada Network in North America tend to have shovel-ready projects and partnerships with local governments so that uh, you aren't making the mistake of, I know, um, I think I'll go and uh, set up an app to sign up for swimming pool slots when maybe your city isn't prioritizing that or is doing something else during the pandemic. So um, those are those are terrific and they can be uh, any amount of time. So some people do an hour a month, some people end up doing 20 hours a month, some people end up doing 20 hours a week and sometimes those people burn out. Um, certain things you need to go in house to work on. So if you wanna work on security at the federal or state level, your best bet is potentially to get appointed to a commission or to sign up for an employee job or a contract. And more and more jobs are available now that are kind of legible to people from private industry or from academia, I think, um, in those aspects of tech. Many people wanna start a civic startup. And I think those work particularly well product companies really, for when you wanna make a tool for government, like let's say transit planning or something specific like that, that mostly government needs to do. Um, uh, there's several companies doing really well in the forms conversion space right now with government as major primary customers. And the things that you need, you need funders who are not only used to the e-commerce ecosystem, um, you need an understanding of the government sales cycle, which is always a bit slower than private sector sales cycles and has you know, some compliance aspects and so forth. Um, and you need a really good ability to form partnerships and obviously a great product. Um, then there are things like mutual aid networks. There are some really cool um, offerings that let communities say uh, set up, give and ask sites after natural disasters when the community needs to support each other or uh, help each other understand which landlords are problematic in a particular city and then help each other with information that way. So there's a lot of cool things like that that gets done without any government involvement at all. And then you've got 
the sort of full scale digital teams and some of their counterparts in the private sector that are big consulting companies that are now trying to replace some of the old government consulting ecosystem with really modern ethical digital focused. So <laughs> let's name a few. So federal digital teams, there's two and a fellowship, right? You've got 18F, United States Digital Service and the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. Um, and it sounds like the new administration is intending to spend some attention on all of those things mm -hmm. based on no inside knowledge, but just signals that come out into public. A and fun then, fact for those are that they, they spanned, they already spanned one transition and they've spanned um, <laughs> Congresses of all makeups um, and got funding. So hopefully yeah. they, they continue. It's been, you know, in the sort of, you know, self-named civic tech movement, there's been an idea that uh, we are at least nonpartisan. I disagree that we are apolitical, but generally speaking, it is a nonpartisan movement. That has its problems too, in some cases, but, but that's sort of where the roots are. There are six states now that have that kind of digital team. Um, I can't list them from memory, but I can find the page of my book that they're on and read them off to you in a bit. <laughs> and many of our large cities have internal digital teams too. Um, so thanks for bringing that up too. I, I think sometimes the state digital teams aren't as known um, and they're new, which means any one of you can just decide that you want to go back to your state and start one. And <laughs> well, the chances that's are- actually, It's hard. <laughs> it is hard, um, but- It's, it's a great it's, project, yes. It's, they're all new and there are people who are really passionate who started them. I mean, obviously new experience and know how to do a yeah. certain number of things, but- um, and I yeah. think isn't like the Beck Center at Georgetown is working with some of the people who are starting the next cohort of state digital teams, I think. Oh, that's yeah, there's an idea that every state should have one of these pretty, you know, hyper competent internal teams that can support digital capacity throughout. Um, and then I guess I should, yeah, I should talk about those uh, consulting ecosystems. So <laughs> mostly out of the healthcare.gov rescue in the first generation, right? You had companies like Ad Hoc and Nava and Siberia, and now we're getting a whole raft of them. Some of them really design oriented like Trust and A1M um, that see their primary business as consulting for public sector entities and specialize in the design and build space with the capacity to work through those contracts, which are not always easy for regular consultants. And so do the, in the chat, there was a slew of a bunch of ad hoc people introducing themselves. So they're here, <laughs> they're here listening as well. Yay. Um, I should pull the chat up. I just had that. Oh, no, you don't. I, I, can, I can share them with you. <laughs> If this helpful. There are also a couple, couple of questions in the Q&A for this topic whenever you're ready as well. Awesome, I'm ready. There is um, Rachel, Rachel Saunders um, said, the Brookings Institute published Turning Point in 2020 looking at AI policy. Um, do you think that there is a need for AI and data scientists to work with local government to ensure that local infrastructure does not let, get left behind? That's a really interesting question. Um, I have a concern that local government getting left behind with what's been going on with AI policy in the private sector may not be the right frame. Um, uh, but I do think that they need to be working together to talk about how to, how and where it's appropriate to implement these kind of technologies for the public good. Um, data scientists, absolutely. Um, there was just a the call for data scientists. Has more data than anybody, right? <laughs> And, and uh, learning more about it and more that they can do with it tends to generally help things. There is also, which agency was I? I want to maybe, say do you remember? The, one of the agencies just put out a massive call for data scientists at the federal level as well. I think it's the digital service and they are looking to help place data scientists across mm -hmm. agencies. Yeah. And then if you all haven't, um, if you're really interested in local AI policy, Gretchen Green, who's a fellow at the Belfer Center, has done a lot of work um, thinking about AI policies at the local level as, as well. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's a, it's a tricky issue. A plug I'd like to add though, is there was a period of time where at USDS, we, we wanted to hire data scientists, but in order to be able to analyze the data, you had to be able to just have data and infrastructure that works. Yes. So before you even get to like AI and fancy <laughs> analytics, you just need to be able to also store your data in a way that works. And yes. in some cases, 
that's where we are. So data engineering and infrastructure is really critical. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, civic tech in general owes a lot to the open data movement and the idea that government data as well as government information belongs to the public and with some exceptions, we should, you know, we should be able to see it and use it. Yeah. Um, but there's still a lot of really valuable data, we know this, right, at, say, Department of the Interior in people's notebooks. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's a whole computerization and digitization and opening and data infrastructure. One more question from James um, Generosa, and then we'll jump to uh, essential or project types. Um, James says, have you approached government workers at state and federal levels about what they might be doing already to link with your efforts? I am thinking specifically of the Library of Congress, the Department of Agriculture as two entities that do a lot with and for their publics. I am sure other government departments do or are trying to do interesting projects that could use your expertise. Um, so I haven't walked up to those kind of departments to sort of volunteer, but I have worked with, or I have been uh, uh, partnering with 18F teams that were working with the Library of Congress for a bit, and we proposed a couple of projects to them. The Department of Agriculture was actually one of the big sponsors of the um, Centers of Excellence for Federal Tech during uh, 2017 and 2018. I think they probably still are, but I don't want to speak to that because I'm not there. Um, there is an unending amount of work, I think, is, is the great answer. And I, I appreciate two things about your questions, James. One, there is an unending amount of work. Um, we need as many people as we can get. And two, um, working with pre-existing efforts is almost always better and has more integrity. Uh, the people who have started those know what's gone wrong the last time they tried and the time before that and just have a wealth of institutional information to provide that a, a less informed effort won't have access to. Yeah. I think on that note too, we can lead into the different project types. And so one of the other questions I think is related to project types too is to clarify the in-house versus external as, as well um, yeah. and the different opportunities there, so. Yeah, so in splitting things into project types, uh, you know, this could change as we go forward, but it, a lot of public interest tech projects split into service delivery, which you often have to be in house, at least at the state or federal level, meaning, you know, on all of our minds in recent days, how are we going to get vaccines to 300 million people? That's a government service delivery challenge that has a tech component as part of its implementation. Um, and I keep seeing people tweet at me about government implementations that haven't quite gotten there in their communities, which isn't uh, necessarily all that surprising. Folks are trying to work incredibly fast and without the tools that they might want to have. Uh, unemployment insurance, another one that's been incredibly relevant over the last year. Um, real challenges with adapting to new policies like the pandemic unemployment assistance at the state level where those benefits are actually delivered. Um, so it can be much lighter weight things too. Uh, the thing about reserving a lane in the swimming pool or, or setting up a summer camp class is also a public service delivery, probably at the local level. So it was trash pickup, you know, all these things that, um, so that's one category. There's a kind of data and infrastructure level and opening up data sets, um, creating APIs so that different departments of the same government can even access each other's data as appropriate or necessary and make use of it. Uh, it's less shiny work. It's less likely to get a lot of public uh, acclaim, but everyone in the know will know that it can unlock all kinds of um, benefits. Then there's sort of tools for governments like the form builders, um, or there's a whole set of transit related um, apps that do different things. Everything from a free thing like streetmix.net which allows members of the public to kind of design a street and then print it out and bring it to their planning meeting or something like Remix or something like Esri that goes into all kinds of geodata. Um, and there's also things that support finding out information um, and participation. So things for participatory budgeting or making public meetings more accessible to more people or even related to um, elections, and I'm not going to say voting tech, I'm going to say election tech, <laughs> um, because there are digital poll books and actual voting machines and online interfaces to check where your ballot has gone. 
Um, it's arguably kind of a service delivery project, but it's in a special arena. Um, and sometimes people think of things like, well, what about, so this is a project we almost did and got partway with at Code for America was a, a CMS for municipal websites. Um, and we all laughed at ourselves for the first two weeks we had this idea because we were talking to our municipal partners and it sure seemed like none of the commercial CMSs were working that well for them because their sites are fundamentally different from a typical 2010 site, which is probably either an ad supported media thing or some kind of e-commerce funnel. Neither of those really applies to your city's website. Your city's website covers two or 300 infrequent transactions that people need to do or that everybody in the community needs to be able to do at any point they need them. So they have this huge navigation function. The typical metrics of a funnel don't make any sense. Um, so you might propose something like that um, just to underpin things that governments commonly need to do. But how do you go about proposing a project? <laughs> Um, there's a couple of ways. It helps, right, if you have some organization, if you, you can start with community meetings. Um, I think one of the most interesting places to look is community groups that work on the issue you're interested in. There is almost certainly a community group that works on any issue that you're interested in and has probably been forming relationships with the local government entities or the state or federal government entities that can affect it through policy or through delivery. Um, so that's a terrific place to start. Um, writing letters is something that works too. There are conferences like the Code for America Summit where government officials and technologists meet and have kind of informal spaces where people might talk about things. Depending on the level of government and the scale and whether you're actually with a company, the process of proposing something is gonna be very different. I mean, there, there are formal RFP processes um, if a government is going to purchase something from you. Um, but Code for America brigades all the time reach out to their partners and say, we're hearing this. Would you introduce us to the person at this department so we can talk about whether it might be useful to do this? You, you made me think of something as you were talking where sometimes in government, it can be hard to figure out how to get a project through or some of the bureaucracy and but there are certain things that governments can do that no one else can, just by sheer yes. being either a state or a city or federal government, you're impacting healthcare at a certain scale or housing yeah. or so many different scenarios at a scale that no one else, no single private sector entity probably ever could. And I was thinking about that in terms of project types that I don't know, I never came across working at any of the tech companies. Yeah, it's super. I mean, it's been really interesting for me too in the courts the last couple of years. So court is a different thing and we have to have courts. And you, you, you realize that, you know, court is a space where speech gets turned into law. And if someone needs something like a restraining order and they go before a judge and they present evidence and the judge grants this, this changes two people's lives, maybe more, just in the space of a hearing that's happened. And that power is, um, it, when used for good, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing how this tech product has such this like deep, deep. And I feel like I hear it in your voice as you're as you're talking. <laughs> I know, I get super excited because I'm a big nerd about this. Because <laughs> yeah. it's amazing. Like, where else can you go? Where it has that level? Right. Where all the skills to build that though is so lacking sometimes too. Right. It's oh. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and you think about one of those kind of those um, civic moments that touches you. You're in the voting booth. You're actually taking an action. You're in the court, and something's going to affect somebody's life. How do you bring that consciousness and that sort of belonging to an institution into a technology product? Yeah. There's um, there's one more one more question that is kind of related. Well, kind of a stretch relate, but it's, it's a definitely important question. Do you have to maintain a neutral public persona um, like many journalists? Sorry, I'm laughing because Kathy's oh, laughing I, because she's I, asking me and <laughs> my Twitter feed is full of F-bombs. And, and how um, careful do we have to be about posting or sharing opinions that seem partisan in public forums <laughs> like Twitter and wondering how to balance pursuing this work with activism? 
on the side. I, there's, a, there's a couple of, so it depends what you're doing, right? If you might be appointed to a fairly high federal office, they are going to look for a Twitter feed that won't embarrass your principal. Um, and so I, my Twitter feed might be over the line and I've been a little extra political the last year or so for reasons. Um, uh, but uh, some of the national partisan divides are less applicable to the subjects, uh, meaning the sort of domain of local government. Um, if we're talking about, you know, housing and swimming pools and parks and libraries and schools, um, you know, what we all think about uh, the Constitution and Electoral College isn't super relevant. So people may not find it a problem if you talk about those things. Yeah. Um, I've seen some, you know, some amazing neutrality from career federal servants. It was really interesting during the transition to the Trump administration to hear how people kind of take care of that and say things like, well, you know, the previous administration um, favored a rights approach to labor law. And that's where we were working up until the new administration came in and the new administration's really focused on enforcement. So we figure for the next few years, we're gonna be seeing a lot of work around enforcement tasks to us. Um, I would just say, if you couldn't work for a median, a normal administration of the other party from your own, then maybe working inside of government isn't always for you. There's an amazing amount of work to be done in campaign tech and in tech for entities that are part of the public sector but aren't governments. Mm -hmm. And in election tech, which I'm gonna persist in screaming should be a nonpartisan issue for everyone to be able to vote. Thank you, Sid. That's always, I think, such a hard, hard yeah. question to think about, right? And also everyone's knowledge varies. And like you said, your principle can really affect. Um, yes. And that question ended with, Activism on the side. I don't know what you think of this. Sometimes when I think about working for government, you're actively doing activism while you're building tech inside government, whether it's working for the court system or like California welfare services or some big federal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, you know, it wouldn't be very appropriate for me to be on Twitter advocating for the California courts to change a policy since they are my main contract right now. I think that would be awkward. Yeah. Um, but uh, they don't seem to mind or they don't seem to have enough people on Twitter to notice that um, I get loud on there. Um, it, it's gonna, it really, it's, it's very, very context dependent, but I don't think it's just like, oh, I'm gonna become civic tech and so I have to give up my online personality. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for asking that question. So thanks for sharing your perspective on that. It's a really good question. It's a really good one, yeah. I mean, we want to get into big tech often because we have very strong opinions about how the government is working. Um, I, I saw in chat that a lot, a, a few more uh, great civic tech folks have also joined. So please continue to share your insights in chat as well. So the next topic that I know we get asked a lot about too is essential skills. What skill should a civic technologist have? Easy question, right? <laughs> Um, no, I think it's a, it can be a really hard question. Um, I think you need a combination of what you might call tech skills, but I think that's broader than many people might assume when they hear tech skills. And almost certainly really, really strong um, communication or consulting skills. Collaboration skills is maybe the best term for it. But when I think about you know, the sort of hard skills that we need, I absolutely include, if you're a mid-level developer, a mid-level designer or product manager, what about if you're a mid-level lawyer? It is so great. And I see you nodding to have a lawyer on your multidisciplinary team from the beginning <laughs> in a government context. Um, and especially a lawyer who's pretty comfortable with tech. Um, those are amazing team members. And- Are you tech product lawyers? Figure out how to get into <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. and, and, you know, and people who are experienced with procurement. Um, so, you know, if you have done things like run budgets or been the chair of a committee or written grants or evaluated grants or those kinds of things, and you also have 
a tech competency where you could teach somebody some tech skill. And I count things like, you know, could you teach somebody to use Google Docs? That's actually a really useful service to do for a lot of partners who've been stuck in a, you know, one ecosystem for 25 years or something. If you, if there's something you could teach, and even better, you know, if you have a really strong tech skill that you could teach, um, mine's always user research, um, and you are willing to not just pull your tickets and complete them, but really be transparent about your practice and what we're doing so that other people can pick up new stuff and you can pick up new stuff from your partners because you will learn a lot doing any of this, I promise. Um, those are the skills that are most important. And I think, yeah, I guess another thing is you need a little meta metacognitive perspective on your skills. So, you know, how good are they? My user research skills are expert level. Um, I can teach that to almost anybody. My service design skills are not far from that. My visual design skills are nowhere near that. And so I can share some things with my partners about how to brief visual design and so forth, but I can't pretend to teach them that. Um, and I, I think that is useful to know when I need to get other help or I need to get other perspective. But even just hearing you talk about that, the just I think the the ability to go into a room and say, these are my expertise and I don't know these other things, especially sometimes at civic tech where people sometimes look at you to know all the tech things. And right. she's like, I don't know these things, but I can teach you these other things. And to be able to walk in and just um, be really true to that is is so powerful. Yeah, so it's it's all those things I think are those are important. Now you will have some of the politest and hardest conversations of your career. So the next topic, we have about 20 minutes left to go through some of the questions and um, two oh, wow. more topics. These are more um, working in regulated spaces and allies, which I, I, all your topics are so critical. I don't know why I keep saying they're important topics. <laughs> they're, they're all so important. Um, but the, what is it like to work in a regulated space um, as a civic technologist? Uh, and especially if some folks have never worked, or at least thought about working in regulated space VR, arguably in the private sector, you also are working in a regulated yes. space. But maybe well, I think it's particular parts of the private sector. So in civic tech too, we're often looking to hire people who have a background in finance or health tech or something else where there are really significant constraints from regulation, usually because it's life critical or otherwise really impactful. Um, so there are a few things, moving fast and breaking things tends to run into a wall, except in really, really specific circumstances. Um, compliance tends to need to be something that you got to work with closely. Uh, procurement is a huge deal. And that means not just how large tech projects get funded, um, which is very different from private sector, but things like how your regular productivity tech gets available. Um, one of the weirdest, biggest problems for government is that it, it has a really hard time getting its hands on standard software as a service. So things like Slack or Figma in MySpace, um, GitHub is usually possible now that it's part of the Microsoft infrastructure, um, but other things may not be. And uh, if you've been used to being a technologist at a private sector company where, you know, maybe you complain, but mostly you get to install on your machine what you want, especially if it's a company that considers itself tech industry <laughs> and is about sort of keeping the tech staff happy. Um, there's a lot more of an adaptability that comes into play. Um, and so can you talk more about for those for folks who've never even thought about or know what procurement is, what is procurement and why is it so important in government? Yeah, so procurement can apply to government buying anything. Um, and government has a lot of rules around buying things that have to do with fairness and some other really important values. And one of the things I think we all get frustrated with government procurement, but one of the most important things is a lot of these rules are there for good reasons. So we don't want people selling to the government at higher prices than they sell to anybody else. We don't want people profiteering off of emergency situations and, and gouging people after a hurricane or during a war or some other 
reason. And uh, fair competition based on price is one of the really common mechanisms for, um, for bidding for a government job. So if you're gonna sell the government 100,000 pencils or a fleet of trucks, um, you're often gonna meet a set of a spec specifications and then compete based on price and delivery time. And trying to apply those rules to a modern technology project gets really, really difficult because often in a tech project of any size, you're gonna learn a lot about what you need as you start to do it. And if you're rigidly tied to requirements and if you have to choose the lowest price, things can go not so well. Um, that's a very simplistic version of it. And I'm sure all the procurement geeks on this call are <laughs> shouting for me to say more, but I don't think we have time. There are a lot of great references and great communities on this. I know Dave Zvenich is right now running a newsletter on it. It's probably worth searching for. No, that's so wonderful. I think sometimes I get questions like, well, why can't the government just build that? And I think some of that is, well, we, there's like a whole history and also reason. Are there, and before we move on to allies, um, what are some scenarios where the regulated space is a benefit or a good thing where having some of that regulation yeah. um, is good for building tech in government? So one thing I think that's really important is that government tech has to be for everyone. Um, you know, any government website is a public accommodation period. And so you can't, and we all think probably that you shouldn't in the private sector, just ignore accessibility until you get to some point when you'll add it later. Um, it really forces you to do the work you should do at the beginning of your project related to any kind of, um, you know, vision or mobility challenges that your users might have, but also languages um, and, and sort of correspondence with how people read and how people speak in your community. We appreciate that um, so much, this idea that we have things in place to build for everyone. Um, and also more importantly- We need more um, things in place that make it easier to do for sure. Yeah. You know, we need, we need uh, prototyping suites that do multilingual really well. We need prototyping suites that are really on with accessibility so that we can do some of those fast things, but still fulfill those important obligations. What I hear when you say that is for those of you on the call, <laughs> <laughs> this is a great chance to come to your government, wherever your government is, and build these prototyping suites that the government can use slash make public, like the U.S. design standards, for example, and, and so many others, right? That That's a great resource, yeah. Um, yeah. That people can use. Thank you. Um, so the final topic, and then there are a few Q&A, but I'll, I'll save that um, for, for, for the end, is allies. Um, partnering with allies, working with allies, what should we know about allies? Well, we need them. And uh, <laughs> that probably won't be surprising, but I think there are several categories that we, we don't tend to think of. I know when I first started in civic tech, I thought, well, uh, you know, I need to get high ranking people to champion my projects. And I still think that's useful, but I've learned a few things like, if your high ranking person is facing an election soon and you are really closely associated with them, there may be a sudden uh, discontinuation of that support. Um, and if you are closely associated with a previous administration, you might get your project swept away just because people often make space for new initiatives. Um, so sometimes there are other categories of allies that are really important. Um, not just the elected or the appointed head of something, but when we did research on this at 18F several years ago, uh, there's a report out there called Best Practices in Digital Transformation that I've always wanted to expand and update actually, but that um, mid-level long tenured public servants who have strong social networks are just incredible allies inside of governments. So this is the kind of person who uh, probably has like a manager title and they've been at the agency 10 or 12 or 15 years and they can talk to the head of the agency and they can talk to the frontline people and they know how the whole thing works. And if they decide that your project is worth it, they can unlock everybody that you need to talk to. Um, so these are important categories of allies. And then I think another one is community organizations that work on what you work on. Um, we have been spending a lot of time with law libraries and advocates for different categories of court case who 
um, help people prepare for eviction court or domestic violence restraining order court or even just help people through mediation for things that are you know more mundane family law matters. Um, these are really important partners too. And uh, I think I will just say that the legal department, wherever you are, is an incredibly important partner that you wanna get on board early. You, yeah. So much better to ask a low fidelity legal question <laughs> and then move up to asking a high yeah. fidelity one as you go along, you know, sort of like, we're thinking of doing this. Do you see any regulations that we should read or <laughs> anything that you would want us to look out for as we're doing that? And then, you yeah. know, you can get the specific proposal to them a month later and have a much better conversation after starting there. That's such a great point. It's, it's uh, getting the low fidelity slowly and then slowly the big yeah. <laughs> right and then when you send it to them for review at the end it's not a surprise they've had a lot of input hopefully you know in a way that hasn't been too painful for you and it can be a, a much less fraught process at that point yeah we um i know when we were at the u.s vigil service figuring out who our allies were and really having a deep respect for so many of the career the career um, um government employees who have just who know where all the servers are, who understand all the complex pieces that it takes to just do adjudication of a claim or something, right? And, right. and know why it's something that yeah. seems really strange is the way it is. And it's usually for something that at least was a good reason at the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Rather than jump on with some like this hubris that I'll just go figure it out and do it on my own, which usually will never, not never, but usually will probably not work <laughs> very well. Um, all right, we, we have about 10 minutes. We have four questions in the Q&A um, and they cover a range of topics. So I'll just go ahead and oh, ask cool. Alex Taylor wants to know, what common approaches have you seen in outside projects, brigade, et cetera, that have um, substantially taken root inside government after an initial push? Alex, that's a great, great question. That is a great question. Um, I think that a lot of work was put into establishing open data and that's been really helpful. Um, I've sort of been the you know, foundation of municipal civic tech for quite a while. Um, I think also a lot of design practices have been introduced that way. And when kind of paired with you know, lightweight training and support and coaching have really brought those types of practices further inside of um, municipalities and, and counties and states to a degree. So, uh, you know, doing user research and bringing along the official, um, having a design workshop and bringing along two or three officials from the department and, and getting them involved. That's really, really effective. Thanks. And thanks, Alex, for that question. Maria, um, the Dart Delgado wants to know, I'm curious to hear about what are the main obstacles you see in building a public digital infrastructure? Oh, that's a big question. That is, yeah, that is a really big question. I mean, part of it is that we have a huge private one right now um, that is kind of minimally regulated and uh, that almost everybody is using. Um, and so to have the public one not just be a uh, kind of a shadow version or a, a, a not as shiny version of that wouldn't work. Um, the regulatory aspects are really, really significant, I think. Um, and people who know more about that than I would do a better job of answering exactly what they are. But I, my impression is that uh, how do you make sure that that's accessible to all? How do you make sure that it's safe? Those are really significant policy questions. So yeah, yeah what do you think, Kathy? You... I, I think some examples that aren't quite like an entire public digital infrastructure, but even just watching government try to coordinate things like a single sign-on, the login.gov, that's 18 app and yes, yes, it worked mm -hmm. on together. Um, I think folks for years like that would never work because it can't work or even coordinating something like a precision medicine initiative across all the agencies. Um, there's an obstacle about the way our agencies and, and the federal, state, and city level too are siloed in ways that I, I think can make any kind of 
public digital anything um, require a ton of coordination, leadership, the tech talent in place yeah. to figure out the complexity of that. Um, That's true. We didn't really talk about the layers and sort of like you could declare that at the federal level, but then it's actually going to get implemented by towns and cities, mm -hmm. which are part of counties, which are part of states, and each of those has regulatory and implementation pieces. So that's also tricky. Yeah. So I'll see interesting parallels with public policy, right? You'll have like a policy at this level and then the rollout at multiple levels. But then with the digital piece, you add the added part of that digital understanding may or may not exist at multiple levels as, as well. Yeah, we um, did manage to electrify pretty much all of the country. So in some ways, you know, I see there's like a, there's a broadband yeah. piece of this that is like rural electrification, like let's get fast internet to everyone. And then we, but we have to talk about the more platformy infrastructure pieces that we really need to participate fully, you know, and some of those are things like um, at home voting that, mm -hmm. you know, became such a, a big deal in the 2020 election. That's a, a sort of piece of public digital infrastructure. Can we all track our ballots and feel safe about them? How do we know that public online conversations are um, safe, authentic, real? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Maria, for that, that question. And I, so you made me think of one more flag as you're talking. This is also, I mean, the US has some challenges. There are some countries where public digital infrastructure is more of a yes. reality, whether they're newer. Uh, Estonia is often used as an example, yeah. but they're newer Taiwan. or younger or yeah. smaller. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Taiwan. Yeah, Taiwan. Oh, Taiwan. Yeah, and Audrey, yeah. And what she's, they're doing there. It's, there are a lot of great examples too that we can yeah. look to, but also recognize their <laughs> limitations. There's a scale issue, I yeah. think, as well. You know, there's a lot we can learn from Estonia and Taiwan, but then we have 330 million people and more than 20,000 government entities. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we lot. have a few more. Carol, um, Salas, and Revalo. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm starting training as a volunteer in Virginia, Washington, for the Biden presidential inauguration tonight for a awesome. pre-inaugural event that you must must be a very busy night for you on January 18th. So knowing this area is sensitive right now, what insight can you please share? <laughs> um, That's an amazing question. And I think provides us with a great example of something that isn't really a tech issue. Um, the, you know, the, the political situation and uh, the, the safety situation right now is, is really intense. Um, I really, thank you for your service in volunteering. Um, I think just being really careful to stick to authentic campaign sources for your information and keep your information flow going back and forth with them seems like a really good idea. Um, yeah. I don't know that uh, that is as much of a, a tech issue per se, although I'm, I'm curious what we'll see in terms of an online inauguration next yeah. week. And so we also touched on such an important part of civic tech too, to understand what actually is a tech problem that you should throw tech at and what is not and that, um, and to know how much tech or to what extent new tech or old tech, or what is a tech problem and, and what's not to understand that as well. Yeah. yeah. So how do you adapt your private sector UX process when you can no longer move fast and break things? Um, sometimes you just figure things will take two to five times as long. Um, uh, I also, oh, I think one of the really interesting things that's different, it's not, you know, I shouldn't be moving fast and breaking things. And also I don't have a whole bunch of the underlying pieces of like a fast cycle UX process in the private sector. So I don't have 10 years of customer signal about what works or doesn't to inform me starting to work on optimization questions almost any of the time. So I really have to go back to, okay, let's try and understand um, what the particular questions are that you're asking if you're coming to the courts with a small claims case and needing to recover money from a conflict that you had with a business associate. Um, so I'm not gonna be doing tiny little tests to see if some little change made a difference in whether somebody acts. And one of the really tricky things too is the court can't really care whether you file that case. 
it's not appropriate. The court can make it easy for you to file that case, but it's not the state of California's business to sort of try to put you in a funnel and get you to file more legal action. Um, so we can't really set up metrics that say, okay, we're gonna see if this design change worked because now we see that more people are going through. It's not the same kind of signal. So figuring out how to understand success um, and do some of that deeper work that hopefully can later inform a really strong product understanding so we can do some of that optimization level work. Yeah. And I mean, I'm doing a lot of work in the responsible tech space. Tech doesn't want to necessarily move fast and break things either anymore. Like that's a mantra that is not has not served us very well in the last decade or so. So maybe government can lead point. the way in, um, the, there's a new phrase floating around to move purposefully and fix things um, or move fast and move purposefully. It's all sorts of variations of that, but there's right. quite a few examples mm -hmm. of people moving fast, but not breaking, not breaking things, things too. And yeah. so maybe move, move a little faster, it. you know, and keep your eye out on the things that are important. Yeah. But that doesn't make as good of a mantra. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll make we'll make the other mantra stick. Yeah, we should get two. Um, we have a we have a minute. Let's um combine these two questions together about the local level and then any parting thoughts from you, Sid, and I think we'll have to wrap up, I know. Um, so the, the final two are from Rachel, Son or no, sorry. Um, yeah, Rachel Saunders and um, who else is in chat, uh, Chad, um, around um, how much can state rights get in the way of a unified approach? And then Chad's re related question is in your experience, what's the impetus for new projects at the local level? Does it usually begin with government, community orgs, outside entities, so both like state rights, but also local level ideas? Yeah. Um, so great question. So I, I don't know if states' rights per se is where the issue is. It's just that states are administratively independent for a bunch of things. And that means they've got a lot of built up technology, infrastructure, and practice, and existing tech that is separate and different. Um, and then the impetus for projects. Um, can be anything from a journalistic report that something is not working well to a group of volunteers proposing something to city officials looking for help or holding a hackathon looking for ideas and prototypes. Um, I think particularly at the municipal level, it can come from a lot of places. Um, the thing that solidifies something is having an internal sort of space to live and to grow. I, I know we're actually at Time, but these two questions are also really important. So if you want to think about them as you wrap up, okay. which is for Allison. Um, so Hi, I, Allison. I know that, Allison. Um, <laughs> what are the main ways in which the big tech has changed during the pandemic? And Ali, which I think is a great way to end. What are the recent wins you're celebrating, amplifying in civic tech that would make you feel optimistic? Oh. Oh, these actually fit together really well. Yeah. Um, one of the things the pandemic has done is make a lot of government entities open to a lot of changes that were moving pretty slowly, like holding meetings remotely, um, you know, even things like court hearings or moving processes online instead of at the counters. Um, there's a great organization called US Digital Response that places volunteers with governments to help with some of these changes during the pandemic. And I think, you know, several of the wins that I've seen have been pandemic related. I know we talked a little bit earlier about crummy vaccine signup applications, but some of the information sites that have been done for COVID by some of the digital teams are just phenomenal digital design and web work. Um, and I think a lot of those were in places where uh, there was a civic tech perspective. There was a long time partnership between some civic tech entity, whether internal or volunteer with the government. Um, and so I think the ability to get an informative COVID site up in a weekend was something that really depended on having some of these civic tech capabilities available to you. And that to me showed a lot of strength and showed me that there's stuff that we can do even during a time of national crisis like this um, to make things easier for the public and for the public servants. Thank you, Sid. Any final, final thoughts before we stop the recording and say goodbye to everyone? Just remember that we need a shelf of books. We probably need yours. Um, and uh, come on in if you're not in civic tech yet. The water's fine. It can be frustrating, but it's incredibly rewarding. Thank you, Sid. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for writing your book, um, A Civic Technologist Practice Guide. 
Thank, um, you, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you everyone for your questions.